good afternoon. Good afternoon to all the, uh, the members of the ICT Academy, the uh, chief guests and invitees for this function, speakers who are here, who spoke before me as well as going to continue the sessions, and uh, academicians and friends. Uh, I'm going to use the 20 minutes to probably push the agenda a little bit more on uh, what has been already covered by some of the previous speakers. Uh, Mr. Kumar Jayant uh, talked about uh, how it is very difficult to predict the future. And uh, he talked about how it is important for the students of today to become resourceful. And uh, when uh, Mike was addressing the audience earlier, he talked about uh, how people need to learn to think outside the box right? and look at uh, ways by which they can collaborate. So my theme is kind of like focused around uh, those topics. But I'm going to start off with, uh, with a favorite uh, movie quote, uh, given that Mike set the tone uh, with his movie, movie quote. Uh, my favorite quote, in keeping with the theme for the session today, is uh, the one by the character Agent Smith from The Matrix, when he says, never send a man to do a machine's work. I don't know how many of you have watched the movie. If you haven't, uh, I would strongly encourage you to watch the movie, because it's got a lot of themes in the movie, right, which uh, resonate with uh, the topic of the session today. But before I kind of dive into what will be relevant for the future in terms of work and skills, three stories. Raymond Kurzweil is the founder of the technological singularity. You might have heard that name. If you haven't, uh, you can look it up. Now, he's a very passionate believer in hard artificial intelligence. When I say hard artificial intelligence, he actually thinks that at some point in time, artificial intelligence will be so powerful that it can take over pretty much everything that's being done by humans today. Now, one of the stories that he had shared was that uh, almost 25, 30 years back, before all of this was really gaining prominence, he participated in a show in the United States. The show is called I've Got a Secret. The objective of the show is this, you come up on stage and then you give clues and the audience and the judges are expected to guess what your secret is, right? Now the secret he had interestingly was he played a piece of music and that music was completely composed by a computer. And this is like 25, 30 years back, right? So that's the first story. Second one, some of you might have heard of VSR. V.S. Ramachandran, he's a, he's a very well-known neurologist as well as a neuroscientist. And uh, he's written a lot of books. Uh, there's a book called The Telltale Brain. Uh, if you're interested in, in how the human mind works, how the brain works, it's a good book to read. And uh, he talks about a research that has been done about geniuses. Geniuses are people who have extraordinary skills and abilities, right? And the point that he makes is that geniuses are able to combine left and right brain functions. You would have heard that many times, right? People are able to bring left brain and right brain functions are more creative. They are more innovative. And those are, again, themes of the session today. And one of the things that he found out is that uh, there are people who are amazingly good with numbers, for example, right? Mathematical geniuses. And when they did research into which parts of their brain cells fired up, right? Which are the neurons? Which of the neurons lit up when they were actually doing their mathematical computations? They found parts of the brain which were completely unrelated with numbers also firing up. Right? For example, the parts associated with image processing and colors. And uh, when they actually delved deeper and asked people questions, right? These geniuses questions. They said that uh, when they look at numbers, they actually look at them in colors, so meaning that prime numbers are a certain color to them, right? And they are actually able to relate to those numbers because they can visualize the numbers in a very, very different manner compared to what we might be capable of. So that's the second thought I wanted to introduce. The third one is something that uh, we have recently done okay, at Latent View Analytics. We helped uh, one of the large movie production houses in the United States. And uh, the project was a very interesting project. What they asked us to do was, uh, take a look at about 5,000 movie posters. And these were all movies that have been made in the last 10 years. And the exercise that they asked us to do was to look at those movie posters 
and then come out with parameters that help define which movie posters will be successful for what type of movies. So if there is an action movie, for example, what kind of colors should be used in the movie poster? What should be in sellout? What should be in the foreground? What should be in the background? Where should the pixelation be dense? What kind of hues should be using? What kind of warmth should be there in the color, right? Many other parameters that you typically look at. And uh, the project that we did, we identify about 10 different parameters which uh, had defined values for specific genres of music. Meaning that if you're gonna make a movie poster for a comedy, then the values of these parameters should lie in these ranges for the movie poster to make sense to the audience so that they will resonate with the movie poster. The reason I'm sharing these uh, three stories, right? The first one about the I've got a secret, the second one is about the genius research, and the third one is, is this movie poster uh, project that we did, is to give you an indication that what is considered as innovative stuff, what is considered as creative work, typically which lay in the realm of human emotion and intelligence, is slowly shifting. The ground is shifting underneath our feet as we speak. The pace of change is so much that we will very soon have situations where creative work, innovative work, right, emotional content work, the ones that we fiercely guard as human capabilities today will also be influenced significantly by the computers and the artificial intelligence of tomorrow. The pace of progress in artificial intelligence and machine learning is relentless. Nobody can stop it. There are four or five foundational trends that kind of is driving this entire phenomenon. So when I said, okay, these three stories are telling me these things, what is the underlying trends? What are the phenomenon that is making this happen, right? That's what I thought about. And uh, I put on a few things, right, which, which I thought I'll share with you. The first one is, uh, is what I call abstraction and encapsulation. Most of you who are in the field of information technology, you will know what abstraction and, and encapsulation means. But let me illustrate it with a different example, okay? When life started evolving on the planet, uh, there were only single-celled organisms to begin with. Over a period of time, the single-celled organisms evolved into becoming multicellular organisms. Now there is one defining moment in that evolutionary time span which most scientists today who do research in that field acknowledge as a defining moment, okay? The defining moment is what is called as the birth of the eukaryotic cell, okay? The prokaryotic cells had certain capabilities. They were also single-celled organisms, but eukaryotic cells acquired some capability which were very distinct from the prokaryotic cells that existed earlier. And what is that? They actually figured out a way by which they can ingest another cell into the body of their cell. Okay? And that's how the eukaryotic cells were born. And what did they ingest? The part of the cell that got ingested into them is what we all today possess as mitochondria, mitochondria in our cells. So if you've done biology in 10th, 11th, 12th, you know what mitochondria means. Mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cells, that's what they're called. Mitochondria were ingested by the preliminary prokaryotic cells into their cell wall in order to become the superior eukaryotic cells. And then after that, the progress of evolution was relentless, nothing could stop it. Now that is abstraction and encapsulation in the biological world. Abstraction meaning that the entire concept of generating energy was actually abstracted as the mitochondria and encapsulation in the sense that it got encapsulated with the body of the other cell so that it could actually progress with the evolutionary trend. Now the same thing that is happening in, in IT, I mean uh, many of us uh, from the earlier generation will be familiar with assembly la language programming, with, with Fortran, uh, with stuff that we would have done. Even, even COBOL is getting outdated these days, where we had to sit and do a lot of coding. Whereas the IT programmers of today, they no longer actually do that stuff. There are so many tools that are available, there are technology that is available for you to easily pull from menu-driven systems. It's just drag and drop features in many cases. 
you just need to think about the logic and the structure though you still need to know what the programming logic is you still need to know how are you going to accomplish the end objective but the way you go about doing it is not by writing assembly language code or working with punch cards as Mike pointed out right when he started out but instead there are so many tools that allow you to do that now in the analytics world we use stuff like R and Python and and SPSS and so on and these are all so much more advanced in comparison to the tools that I started using right when I got into my career now that is abstraction and encapsulation at work I don't need to worry about the implementation within the tool itself as long as I know what the mathematical concept is I can work with that so that's a very important underlying trend the second one is the evolution of big data technologies I'm not going to get into the details of that uh, you all know Hadoop and, and, and HANA and Hive and Redshift they are the latest buzzwords right uh, but what is more interesting around the big data technologies is the availability of data itself there is so much more willingness on the part of humans to share more about themselves to open up more and you all do it right when you download and install an app from the Apple Store or from Google Play Store you go ahead and hit the accept button for all the conditions that come up right that this application would like to know this that 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 don't even read it these days you are completely fine we are all completely fine accepting all of the intrusion into our privacy maybe even right because we believe that by opening ourselves more to all of these apps and these technologies we can benefit more as well meaning that I can get more tailored products services recommendations whatever it might be so the willingness to open up more means that we're going to be creating an abundance of data as well okay in the future that's a very important underlying trend the other one which most of us will be familiar is with uh, with Moore's law okay of uh, accelerating memory as well as processing power cost meaning that the cost of memory and the cost of processing power is is dropping at an exponential rate so that we can pack more and more memory and more and more computing power into smaller and smaller devices so therefore the availability of capability to process a lot of data using the intelligence and the technology and the tools that are, that are available that will dramatically increase it will continue to increase it's already increasing it will continue to increase at a, at a larger fold so what does this mean just want to share one case study okay here and uh, this is again some work that we have done recently for a large German auto company and uh, they came to us with uh, with this uh, data that they were getting from all the uh, sensors that they had put in the cars they had over 20 sensors in the cars and all of these sensors were generating data at a phenomenal pace meaning that some of them will ping data back to the servers every second some of them will do it every minute some of them will do it like every hour right but the volume of data that is coming and this is in all the cars so they have sold thousands hundreds and thousands of cars all the cars are pinging data using these IOT devices into the servers you got to take all of the data process it and the brief that they gave us was this we want you to study the data and tell us if there are any interesting patterns that's it okay that is the only brief they didn't tell us like we are looking for this particular problem or we want you to solve this problem nothing like that they just said that look at all the data that is coming from the IOT devices and tell us whether you see any interesting patterns and we did okay the the patterns however were not intelligent to us when we looked at it we had to actually bring together people from their design engineering team from the marketing team we need to compare the data with the customer demographics what the IOT data was telling us was just what is the usage of the cars how often are people starting and stopping them how are they accelerating how are they braking how are they using the steering wheel how are they using the handbrake how are they using all the other gadgets in the car how is the engine getting heated up that's the kind of data that the IOT data told us right what we were able to piece together though was by putting together this IOT data with the consumer demographics with the marketing information meaning that the marketing department is trying to market these cars to the consumers assuming that the consumers are looking for certain features the design and engineering department is trying to engineer certain features into the car expecting that the car will be driven and used in a particular way now what our work helped us do is to put together all of these different dimensions right into one place so that we can actually look at all of it and then say are these patterns starting to make sense why is a particular set of cars which has been sold to a particular target audience 
while it has been intended for use in a certain way, why is it being used in a different way? That's the kind of analysis that we were able to do. Now, I just wanted to give that example because uh, that kind of leads me to talk about what I believe is therefore important for students and academicians in terms of the skills that you need to develop. Because this shifting landscape in terms of analytics and artificial intelligence and machine learning and all that stuff, the underlying trends that I spoke about earlier, basically boils down to a few essential things, okay, in, in my mind, in terms of what organizations of the future would want to look for in people that they're going to be employing in future. I think familiarity with logic and structure and algorithms will go without saying from an IT perspective. Pattern rec recognition, I think uh, pattern recognition will be an important thing. I mean, and pattern recognition, uh, uh, you don't need to think that that is only in the domain of IT. I mean, pattern recognition is used in pretty much any field where you're doing research, where you're trying to understand more about what the underlying stuff is. More importantly, I would say that students would need to become truly multidimensional. Multidimensional in the sense that you are able to look at the problem from very different perspectives. And that will be possible only if they collaborate with one another. And again, touching upon the point that was made earlier, you cannot do all of those things on, our own, on your own. Uh, when I saw the video that was played during the interval, uh, there was a mention of the gig economy, right? Where most people are going to go and work for themselves. They're not even going to get into employment in future. But if you go down that path, you are likely to become more and more specialized in what you do. And unless you are able to bring together people with very different specializations and form a cohesive team which can collaborate with one another, we will not be able to achieve the innovation and creativity that we are, that we are looking for. So that will be a very important aspect of the multidimensionality coupled with the collaboration. And if we are able to take an interdisciplinary approach to doing work, even on campus, I think that will be a very important skill. I mean, so today when students are asked to do projects, I know that uh, students from the electrical electronics department came and accepted prices earlier today. Students from the mechanical department came up and accepted prices for the, uh, for the uh, contest that was run by the ICT Academy. Next year, one of my suggestions would be, can you actually set up interdisciplinary projects where people from multiple departments come together in order to actually come up with something which is hard hitting from a realistic perspective, which solves a real life problem. Because that's the kind of skills that you need. Now you need to pull together people from different departments and tackle real problems uh, that are there in front of you. So I think uh, a combination of these kind of skills is what will make people effective in, in what they're going to be doing in the field. So learning to learn, being resourceful, being multidisciplinary, collaboration, and actually being able to think out of the box. Now, these are going to be pretty critical skills uh, in the coming days. Now, uh, some of the stuff that I mentioned, uh, they will resonate also with the uh, artificial intelligence and the machine learning stuff, you know, the, the encapsulation and other things that I, that I talked about earlier. Uh, so you, you might ask, so what is different? Uh, if the machines are going to be anyway doing a lot of that stuff, how do you focus on the creative and the innovative aspects you know, that the humans are truly capable of? My uh, rejoinder to that would be that uh, unless you truly understand what the machines are capable of, you cannot go beyond them, okay, in some sense. Uh, true transcendence is possible only if you truly understand whatever that's, that's your, that you're working on. So I would say that uh, uh, it'll be pretty important to look at it from that perspective. Just uh, one final thought on how we can go about doing that, and uh, I read, read about this uh, recently, uh, and, and there's a very interesting concept. So you, know, you all know what a post-mortem is, right? A post-mortem is performed when, uh, when somebody dies, and then you're trying to establish what is the cause of death, right? But in a post-mortem, unfortunately, the person is already dead, right? No amount of your analysis is going to bring that person back alive. So I would encourage all of you to adopt what I would call as a pre-mortem mindset. Okay? A pre-mortem, uh, ironically, is, is like this. I mean, the, the surgical team and the team of nurses walk into the room, and they are about to operate on this person. But even before they commence the operation, they just do a pre-mortem, saying that, assuming that the patient is dead, right? what have we done wrong for that to happen? Right? They think from that perspective. And then, therefore, figure out 
what all could potentially go wrong and then try and prevent that from happening right to begin with itself so in some sense i think uh, we are at a fairly critical stage in terms of uh, how we help the students of tomorrow become better at what they do so uh, it'll be fantastic if we can adopt a pre mortem mindset right and then cleanse things up before it is too late thank you for the audience